Chuck. You have to be ready to talk whenever, <laughs> in season and out of season. So my name is Tracy, and as um, Pastor Chuck said, I have been working in Uganda since 1997, back and forth. And God has called me home now. I'm here back, although my heart has been in Africa for many years. It's been a struggle for me to be back at home. But, you know, one of the things that God is teaching me recently is that we need to be obedient to him and do his will. You know, we can be doing a lot of good things in life, and it may not be God's will. And so we can get off of the path that he has for us, even in doing good things and lots of things. You know, we need to focus on what it is that God has for us to do. So for right now, God has me at home, and I'm thankful he has really blessed me. And so he's also blessed me with the privilege of meeting many people in different countries in Africa. I've traveled, but mostly in Uganda. And so Pastor Richard Apio was my pastor for a year when I was there in a town called Jinja. And so his church was right around the corner from me, and he really ministered to me when I was there during that time. Um, I, there, I remember a, one time he preached about the last chapter of Acts where he talked about the storm that Paul had gone through. And I was going through a storm at that time, and it ministered to me so much, and I'll never forget. You know, there's certain sermons that you never forget because God really ministers to you during that time, and he really ministered to me during that time. So I'm going to invite him to come up. He um, has been here in the States working on a doctorate degree at a uh, university in Illinois near Chicago. So he's been traveling back and forth and been uh, ministering to the Romanian church. You know, we don't have as many missionaries coming from America these days. The missionaries are coming from Africa, from Korea, from Brazil, and they're going out through the rest of the world and even coming here to minister to us in America and to teach us here. And so I'm very thankful that he's here. He's been, he had a connection to the Romanian church through some crusades that he was involved in and then went to Romania and now ministers to the Romanian churches in America. So it's nice for him to come to this church too. One of the things I love about this church is it's a mixed church so we have people from everywhere in this church and it's awesome <laughs> so thank you it's good to see you <laughs> so pastor Pew. so I'm very happy to introduce him to you thank you Uh, this uh, set for Tracy. I'm a lot taller, so I need them a bit higher. Hmm. Thank you. Pastor, I want to know how long I should go. Now, this morning you have uh, a test of uh, humility in that I don't speak with an American accent. <laughs> but uh, I believe that each one of us has been looking forward to meeting the Lord Jesus yeah. in this service. And I promise you, if he came physically, he would not have spoken to you in an American accent. He would have spoken to you in a Galilean accent. And you would still have had to have humility uh, to receive a word from him. And uh, this morning he's chosen that I would have this opportunity to share with you his word. And I wouldn't say I'm going to speak with a Ugandan accent because when you come to Uganda, there are so many language groups. And the different language groups speak differently. We're all influenced by our local dialects or mother tongues. But I'll try to be clear in terms of the clarity I can give with my accent. Some words I'll repeat so that if you miss one, you'll get the other. <laughs> <laughs> but I am, first of all, proud to be associated with uh, Tracy. Uh, she has had such love for Uganda and for underprivileged communities some of the places she has gone to work in are difficult even for me as a Ugandan to go to work to, I mean to work in. And uh, may God bless her labor in the Lord and whatever seed she has sown there 
May they bring fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. Um, then my appreciation to Pastor Chuck and his entire leadership for allowing me to come, but also to for giving me friendship, taking care of me, making sure I had uh, somewhere to sleep, breakfast this morning before coming to the house of God. Thank you very much. I appreciate. God bless you. I know that is the second time I come to your church, but um, when you go to a church more than once, you you'll usually have different people in the church. So you need to introduce yourself again and again at times. So I'll do that again. I'm Richard Epiu. The last name is E-P-I-U. I'm married to Monica, and we have six children, three girls, three boys. And they're actually in that uh, order. Four of our children are above 20, so I'm an old man. But we have uh, two boys, 15, 13. They're the ones who are still with us, plus our youngest daughter, who is a medical doctor. She still works while at home with us. And she's also been trying to run for office, uh, at first for house, but then she was so frustrated uh, because of the way things go there bribery and so on and then she has tried to run to get into the youth council national council that also has been very difficult and as the sister this morning was talking about Joseph it's what I've been feeling about my daughter that God could be taking her through some of these situations preparing her for something bigger now as I have been looking forward to coming to preach in your church I've been in conflict in that there are two messages I would have desired to bring. One would have been on woundedness to discuss whether being wounded is a liability in the kingdom or it is an asset. But the other one seems to overweigh my desire to preach on that one. And since I'm only in your church this Sunday, um, we'll see whether next time I come the Lord would like me to speak on that one. But this morning, I wanted to share on becoming or remaining, if you already want, a healthy, growing congregation by focusing on the Great Commission. And I would like to request you to stand up. I'm used to this in the Romanian community where I preach regularly. They will usually stand for the preaching of the Word of God. They will usually kneel for prayer. And as I get older, uh, many times I kneel at a cost. Sometimes I'm, I'm on my knees and saying, when are we standing up? Because <laughs> it's not all that easy anymore. But I want us to read from Matthew, a familiar scripture, but I'm going to share it from uh, perhaps a different angle. Uh, each time the Lord speaks to us from the same scripture, there is something new to learn or something that the Lord wants to emphasize. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Nations there, ethnic groups, people groups, language groups. Not uh, political nations like the United States, Libya, and so on. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to appreciate you for the gift of life, but much more life in Christ. We appreciate you for knowing you, for becoming your children. And yet you have elevated us to serve with you in your vineyard. And as stewards of Father in heaven, we are required to be faithful. And I pray for my brethren in um, 
this church that your hand would be upon us this morning that you would speak to us as a master speaks to servants as a man speaks to a friend and that Lord you would challenge us you would instruct us where necessary you would reprove us and correct us but also Lord that Lord you would affirm us and you would energize us to do your work in Jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. Um, you may be seated. Uh, becoming a healthy and growing congregation by focusing on the Great Commission. I have served in Deliverance Church Uganda under a number of capacities. I've been a pastor, so I speak partly from experience. Um, and that for a number of years, 1986 up to 2005, when I was asked to move to the national office uh, to t take a new role of training leaders and continue to coordinate evangelism, um, doing research in terms of uh, coming up with doctrine and policy, which the top leadership discusses so that we can guide the rest of the over 270 congregations that we have within the country and I'm part of that top leadership and um, as a result of that uh, because I was coming to preach in the US again and again I also decided to take up a course to equip myself better to be able to address the need for leadership in the African continent because even before I came I was training leaders, sometimes part-time, uh, going to the seminary to preach, I mean to teach, uh, leaders from Congo, um, Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and of course Uganda. And so I thought I would take up a course to train to be able to equip others better. And I'm doing a doctor of ministry in leadership and ministry management at the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School at Deerfield, Illinois. I'm about to finish uh, that program. But as a part of what I am doing uh, for my doctoral major project, I decided to develop um, a manual for training urban pastors in Deliverance Church, Uganda to move their congregations from stagnancy or decline to health and growth. Because what I did discover is that um, while our congregations tended to grow quite a lot when the ministry was young, when the congregations were new, many of them have tended to decline or to stagnate, which is really what happens in the life cycle of any congregation anywhere else in the world. Congregations like people have life cycles. They are born, and then of course they grow in their days of youth, and then they mature, but once they mature, they begin to degenerate, just like we do, up to old age and death. Now, fortunately for congregations, you can re uh, begin the cycle again, and you can take a charge through transformation so that it can put in components that will cause it to grow. And so that is partly what I'm doing. And this, even as I move here preaching and do my studies uh, in the Trinity, I'm giving consultancy uh, online while I'm here to the uh, six churches uh, whose pastors I have trained, whose elders I have trained, and whom I'm taking through this transformation uh, for them to be able to grow from where they are to, to where they should be, uh, perhaps from 200 to 800, 400 to maybe some thousands, because some of these congregations are already putting up large sanctuaries, uh, as big as 2,000 capacity, which they are not able to fill up uh, yet. In fact, one of them, the uh, sanctuary is near to completion, but there are only about 300 people. And so you have a lot of empty space, and the challenge is to help the leadership there to fill that up with people who love the Lord and worship Him and serve Him. 
But in my course of study, I discovered that in the United States, there are 375,000 congregations like yours. And um, according to the Banner Research Group, 85% of those congregations are either stagnant or declining. And uh, 10,000 of them in the next few years will actually disappear. They will close their doors, they will cease to be. And a few of us know that congregations are born, congregations live and grow, but they also die. And that's why today we don't have the Jerusalem church with us, where the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. We don't have the church of Antioch, which is St. Paul. We don't have the seven churches who received the letters, personal letters from the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. They don't exist. They died. And our congregation will go the same way if we do not take heed um, to what it takes to restart the cycle of a congregation again. Now, one of the major reasons congregations decline, stagnate, and die is because after some time, when the congregations begin, they are missional, they are focused outward, they are focused on the Great Commission, they are focused on finding members to make the church. Once they have the members, they begin to focus inward. And the demand is put on the pastor to spend most of his time meeting the needs of the members. And so what that means is that the energy of the pastor is sapped, his vision is reduced to just looking on the inside where the congregation is, and he's supposed to do all the visitation, he's supposed to be in a hospital when every mother is bringing a new baby, he's supposed to dedicate them, he's supposed to bury the dead, and uh, in Uganda you can end up doing a lot of this. As a pastor, there was a time when people were dying so much. I was burying about three dead people each week. And at some point, I said to God, am I a pastor for the dead or for the living? <laughs> because, you know, I was carrying out so many burials at that time. But God helped us to go through that difficult situation. And as a congregation, unless you do something to make sure that your congregation continues to grow in your generation and beyond your generation, it will be one of those 10,000 whose doors will close. Because, as a matter of fact, not so many years ago, I watched some documentaries about Europe, Western Europe, Britain, and they were showing documentaries of churches which were once full of worshippers but were empty at the time. And some of them had been bought by revelers and they had been turned into nightclubs. Others by Muslims or Hindus and they were being turned into mosques and uh, temples. Reason being that when the elderly people who loved the Lord and who knew him like the generation of Joshua died, their children did not continue in the Lord. One of the concerns I have as I sat at the back is how many young, few young people are in your church. And I'm just wondering what the future of your church is, but I don't know the circumstances. Maybe you have a different service for the young people, so I could be wrong here. But for a declining or stagnant congregation or any congregation for that matter to grow and to remain healthy, it must focus on the Great Commission among other things. About seven years ago, in a village called Okomion, in Omatenga Parish in Kumi District, where I am born, um, a cousin of mine called Angela, a housewife, desperately wanted to talk to me at a burial. I had lost another cousin, a, paternal, a maternal cousin, and uh, we were at the funeral. 
And now in Uganda, a funeral is a place of sorrow. You're not supposed to be chatting and laughing and talking lightly. So I was not in the mood to hear somebody talk to me at that time because this was a close relative. But Angela Apollot desperately wanted to talk to me. And because she nagged me, I eventually leaned toward her to hear from her. And she asked me in a low voice, do you remember several years ago that uh, you shared Christ with me in your house and you led me to Christ? I said, no, I don't. She said, you did. And after I went back home, I shared the gospel with this man, introducing her pastor, who is now my pastor. And our church is 300 members. Then I shared the gospel with this other man, who is my husband, introducing her husband. And then I shared the gospel with this other man, who is a pastor of another church now. And she said, as a result of my witness, seven congregations have been planted in this area. All together, 700 members. Ours is 300 members. Now, you're not talking about a town like um, Brandenton. You're talking about a village, up country, where homes are scattered. They're not together. Okay? And yet, this village girl or village woman, housewife, probably with elementary education of about four to six years only, was able, after sharing, I mean, receiving Christ, without any appreciable amount of discipleship or discipling, to share her faith with others. To the extent that she was able to raise pastors and plant other congregations. And she said to me, this is all because you led me to the Lord Jesus Christ so many years ago. When are you coming to see your grandchildren? And uh, shame on me, I have not gone ever since. But I'm told that Angela has relocated. They have bought a piece of land in another part of the country uh, with her husband. But what I know from that testimony is that even where she's going, she's going as a missionary, a church planter, who has never been to a Bible college, but she just has Jesus Christ in her heart. She knows that she was once blind, now she can see. And she has a story to tell, and she tells that story in the simple village language that she can um, as a housewife, and people have been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a challenge for you and for me. With our much education, many opportunities, the so much exposure that God has given to us, we cross roads with many people each day. Now, one of the crucial issues we must determine for our congregations concerns God's purpose for the church, that is the church universal, and for any congregation. Why does a congregation exist? Does God have a purpose for your congregation, for the congregation where I come from, for um, Tracy's con congregation or any other congregation? And if it does, what, according to the Bible, is our main task as the church? My wife and I have had the privilege of traveling from one country to another. Sometimes it's been for ministry. In her case, it has been for studies. And at one time, she went to continue her studies in the UK. It was really a faith project on our part. And I visited her there, and from the time we got married, because of the circumstances, she had not worked. She had left her employment uh, to take up the new role in, my, in, in the home, and uh, it simply meant that she was out of employment for a long time. But then she needed to get back into employment. And uh, usually this is very difficult. Once you're out of a job for a long time, it's difficult to get in. So while I was in London visiting her for a few weeks, 
one of the things I was forced to do was to begin looking at the job ads to find a, find a job for my wife. And after as I bought papers and I kept searching each day, one of the things you find in these ads is that they always will give a job description for the kind of person that they want. It is the employer who gives the job description. But I'm shocked that in Christendom, in the church, most of the congregations and Christians think that when you want to serve the Lord, you come up with your job description. And then you present it to the master who should be your employer. Because he says they hired us, some at 8, some at 4, some at noon, and so on. And then you want him to bless it or to get involved in what you have come up with. Rarely do we take time to seek the Lord, to wait on Him, to inquire of Him, to find out, like Paul, when uh, he, called, he met the Lord, what would you have me do, Lord? And I think that it goes for individuals as well as for congregations. There comes the con a time when a congregation needs to humble themselves before God from time to time to seek the Lord, to find out what you want me to do, what you want us to do, which is consistent with the Lord's prayer. Thy will, not mine. You know, thy will be done. It should be Him giving us a job description, telling us what to do. Now from scripture, I believe that the church has a tripartite task or responsibility, a threefold responsibility. What I have called the upward, the inward, and the outward. And uh, I believe that the first two most important commandments support this. The first one says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, I think to 38. And the other one talks about loving our neighbor as loving ourselves. Now, that first commandment gives us our upward task or responsibility, which is our responsibility toward God to love Him, to worship Him. And uh, whenever we come to our services like we began today, we usually begin with worship. Our hands go toward Him in appreciation and thanksgiving for the great things He has done in our lives, in saving us, in healing us, in sustaining us, in taking us through life's journey. But also for who He is because He is worthy to be praised. And uh, usually... If a church has the Spirit of God, you do not have to do a lot of motivation for people to do that. That's the reason they come to the house of God anyway. They come to sing their favorite songs and they come to meet their favorite friends. And uh, hoping that one of the favorite friends is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Then we have the inward task of the church which is ministering to itself, the one another ministry. And there are lots of scriptures about this. Uh, for instance, uh, the Bible tells us that teaching them, baptizing them, now the moment people are one to the Lord, they are supposed to be baptized, they are supposed to be assimilated into the body, into the church, and they are supposed to be taken through a... Uh, um, a time of discipleship, which is really, discipleship is a lifetime journey, as it were. Not just a few days, then you become a member and you cease to be a disciple. We are continually disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, the Bible talks a lot about the body ministry, the one another ministry. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to about 16, Bible says God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, 
pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But as each part performs it is a task under the Lordship of Christ in love supplying that which is each part requires the Bible says the whole body grows up to the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ in all respect. Salvation is both personal and corporate. Um, I went to pray for a couple uh, in Fort uh, Lauderdale and they hadn't been in church for many, many years. And um, I don't know reasons for this, but I try to encourage that couple to say, hey, the Bible says not to neglect the assembling of together as a habit of some. There is something about fellowship. There is something about the house of God which somehow services us. Like, you know, you take a car to a garage every now and again and it gets the oil changed and so on. Coming to the house of God, sometimes there are things God takes care of without you coming to the prayer line. You come heavy, you come sick, but you go back refreshed, you go back oiled. You go back with a vision. You go back with a word with which God has touched you and you're able to go on for a number of, other, uh, a number of years walking on that word. And so God expects us to minister to one another. God expects us to do body ministry. The Bible says that according to the measure of faith and grace God has given to every man, okay, let him serve. And we have different gifts with which we can serve. In the early church, not only did they meet in the temple, but they also met from house to house. They broke bread and they shared what they had with one another. Body ministry. Again, most congregations, including those which are declining, are good in those two. When they meet, they meet to worship the Lord. They sing and say in Uganda, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. <laughs> okay? Hallelujah, 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 and so on. And they mean it. You also don't have to do much to tell people to minister to one another. In any case, when a church stagnates or declines, most of the services of that church, most of the programs actually serve the needs of the people inside the church. The Sunday service since we came in has not been for unbelievers. It's been for us. It was us worshipping the Lord. It was us hearing testimonies from one another. We are the ones receiving the teaching of the word this morning. It wasn't sinners. And we are the ones receiving the word right now. It is meeting our needs. Now, that's not very bad. But when a church goes on like that, on and on and on, it begins to reap what it is sowing. Because we are sowing internally, we get nothing added to us. And churches begin to decline, including big churches. The numbers begin to go down. And probably they sell out, uh, they sell the big sanctuary because they can no longer maintain it. They go to a smaller one. And so on and so on. Eventually, they might as well close. Mainly because they started focusing inward rather than outward which is what happened to those uh, congregations in Western Europe. Because some of those were probably the congregations that sent missionaries to Africa and to other parts of the world. And uh, we had the benefit. And because of their work, I'm here. But it's unfortunate that their own children did not continue in the faith. And we have a challenge before us as um, this faith church in terms of not falling into the same trap. Praise the name of the living God. One of the metaphors the Lord Jesus Christ uses about the church, or even Paul, is the body. And of course the body ministers to itself. One member ministers to another member. And that's a healthy thing to do. But 
the church is not meant to be I mean think about this suppose here in Brandenton all of you own cars this Sunday morning and needed gas you went and put in gas in your cars and then you parked the car in the gas station left it there and maybe next Sunday if you didn't feel it you added some more left it there I wonder what the owner of the gas station would do you probably might call the authorities call the police and tow your vehicles out of the gas station because the gas station is not supposed to be for packing your vehicles it is supposed to be for fueling up once they are fueled up they must fire up and go wherever they should go if it is to charge to charge to business to business if it is a, a greyhound bring Richard to Brunton okay it's not supposed to remain in the gas station now the sanctuary the local church congregation is supposed to be like a gas station we come to hear the word of God we come to be fired up we come to fill up but after we fill up we must go out into the road and get working get serving the Lord we should not just park in the sanctuary here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, until the next Sunday, until the following year, and so on and so on. Which brings us to where I want to focus. That is the outward or external task of the church, which is to pursue the Great Commission. Amen. The second uh, commandment, which the Lord Jesus Christ says is the second most important, important says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first neighbor we talked about are the members of the body of Jesus Christ in the church where we are. But then there are other neighbors. There are other neighbors. Those are the neighbors who have not known Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. We have a responsibility toward them by way of the Great Commission. We need to understand that this whole issue of mission originated from God himself. The Bible says that in the fullness of time, God sent his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then Paul says in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, Galatians 4.4, 4, as a Davidic son, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12 to 16 and then of course the uh, first chapters of uh, Matthew and Luke talk about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and of course the genealogy which uh, begins with Abraham and, in and includes David in some cases and uh, God purposed that through the Lord Jesus Christ all the peoples of the earth would be blessed because he was that seed of Abraham through whom not only the Jews but also other peoples of the world, the Gentiles would be blessed. And Jesus came and gave his life as a ransom for many. A price of redemption. He died on the cross. He shed his blood because he wanted to redeem not just a Jew but the Gentile also from the power of sin. And uh, he has brought us in. And in bringing us in, we dare not enjoy the comfort and the privileges which come with our redemption in this life as an end in itself. Yes, we must enjoy the favor of God as our sister was preaching this morning. We must enjoy his blessings, but at the same time, we are stewards before God. We are given responsibility. Amen. And um, the Great Commission is the main task of the church outward. Amen. The main commission means, the Great Commission means that the results which any congregation should be focusing on should be making disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. From the time I started training the pastors, I also put in place 
lines of accountability. I developed also a form to ensure that at the end of every month they are able to fill up that form and tell me how many people they have reached, tell me how many people got converted, how many people have been baptized, how many have been added to the church, how many are being discipled and how they, they are being discipled. In other words, we need to be accountable. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, what consumed Jesus? When he called his disciples, what did he call them for? Did he say to them, come and I teach you to worship? So maybe he began some seminars of worship. Although worship is not to be despised, it is something that's necessary. Did he take them to a prayer seminar? Come and I teach you to pray? In the fact, it was them who asked to be taught how to pray. But that was not the main reason Jesus called them. Although he wanted them to learn prayer and to pray with him a number of times. Primarily, when he called his first disciples, he wanted to teach them to be fishers of men. And he didn't just take them to a classroom and begin teaching them. He taught them by doing. He went out to all their villages and to all their towns, the Bible says. Teaching, preaching, casting out devils, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, the Bible says. And at one time, the Bible says he had such compassion upon them. Now, the word for compassion is very strong. It actually means that his bowels moved. It's like Jesus, you know, had a running stomach after he saw these people in that kind of situation. Which makes me think that if Jesus was here physically, one of the places he might have visited is Brandenton. And when he comes around, he wouldn't so much want to go to your beaches and look at your tourist attractions here or into your restaurants. He would go where people are because I know Jesus, he mixed with the people. And he would respond the same. He would see the people desperate, a sheep without a shepherd. And he would probably say, pray ye to the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers into the harvest. And before you even begin to pray, he would have put you in a tools and told you to go to every house here in Brandenton. Because that's what he ex uh, actually did with his disciples in Matthew chapter 12. So going back to the text that we read, first of all, I want us to notice that the main focus of the Great Commission is to make disciples. Go into all the nations or into all the world and make disciples of those nations. Baptizing those who are converted in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and then teaching them to observe all that I have, have commanded you, Lo, I'm with you always, even up the close of the age. That simply means that if the church is involved in the Great Commission, there should be growth. At a time when I thought of beginning giving this consultants to our churches, we had reached the point when we felt that across the country not many of our churches were growing. And we are supposed to be a Pentecostal denomination. We have planted quite lots of churches. And yet, time comes when congregations just stagnate. They plateau, they decline, they want to grow. And our ministry had hired some experts to carry out um, a church ass assessment and a strategic planning um, process together with some of the top leaders. And for one of my assignments, I was required to be attached to them. And that meant I got into lots of, lots of their documents. Now, one of the recommendations they made was that each of our congregations should be required to grow by about 30% through new converts added every year to the membership. Now, when you talk about a healthy, growing congregation, at least experts on this subject tell us that 
A congregation is healthy and growing if it is adding at least 10% to its current membership through new conversions and baptisms. Not just transfers, not just biological births, but um, people who are actually accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior and are being added. What you find, however, in many congregations is that the front door where people are coming to the church is as open as the behind door where people get out. So, several people get out each year, the same number comes in. So the number just remains the same. But the people change with time. Apart from the leadership and the old timers. And um, the Bible expects us to grow. It seems to me that um, right from creation, God gives us the idea that anything which has life should reproduce and should grow. He could have filled the world, all the Americas, Africa, and Asia, with human beings, just like he created fish and said, let there be fish. And the fish just filled up the oceans and lakes. But he decided to create just two male and female, and he told them, reproduce and fill the earth. Jesus could probably had, have done the Great Commission himself before he went to heaven, and then just went with the church when he's going back. But he decided to leave the work with a few disciples whom he had trained, whom he had entrusted his truths to, and so on. And we are part of that chain. And he expects us to grow. Now, one of the problems of small churches, which is also one of the things they love very much, is that everybody knows one another so much. Relationship is treasure to such an extent that even if a pastor came with a vision for growth, people don't want to grow. Because they think we are going to lose our relationships. We no longer will be able to know one another. And they also think they'll uh, uh, lose quality in terms of spiritual quality of the church. But it takes the Spirit of God to keep one soul in holiness as it takes the Spirit of God to keep thousands in holiness. We see that in the other church that God was not afraid with an explosion. 3,000 people got getting saved. And being led by these people, he, was, he could have been unsure of, you know, who were fighting for position and so on. But God was willing to entrust them with 3,000 souls in one day. And then another time, 5,000 men. They didn't even count the women and the children. And then the Bible tells us every day, God added to their number as many as were being saved. God is not afraid of numbers. In any case, it is by him that the whole world is filled with people, filled with creation. It is by his grace. He sustains them all. He's not afraid that someday it will explode a bit too much. He can't feed them. He can't sustain it anymore. No. So if you are one of those who thinks that small is better in terms of church, I want you to understand it takes the same God, the same grace to sustain a small or big church. But when you are given grace to grow by God, it means you have also been given more impact. Because a small church has some impact. But let's face it, a big church has a lot of impact. Um, I met an African man who is in Ukraine he went there to study but God spoke to him and told him to begin a church so he began to learn Ukraine, he's black like me perhaps darker, I don't know and uh, he began a church in Ukraine, which at the time I met him in 2005 in a conference, the church was 20,000 members strong adult members and I'm told that a number of people in government go to his church when they important decisions, they consult them because there are many opinion leaders there. And that black man in Ukraine has had a lot of impact. 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have said, I'm not an American. In Africa, we do small things big. I mean, small. It's the Americans who do big things. But he trusted on the big God, the God of heaven. And God has grown that church to become the largest church in Ukraine. Because he has been willing to follow some of these principles. Now, the scope in terms of this outward task is the unsaved. In uh, Acts chapter 1, Jesus told his disciples not to go away from Jerusalem, but to wait until the Holy Spirit has come upon them, who then enable them, empower them to be witnesses, beginning from their Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Sometimes people are willing to go to the uttermost, but find difficulty in confronting the immediate community around them. But that certainly needs to be done. And yet, your ability to do that will very much be compromised if you are tiny, small congregation. But if God enables you to grow, to impact your community, because resources are in people, in terms of the human resource that you can send abroad as missionaries, in terms of resources to support work abroad, is the people who have the resources. And my prayer for your community is, your church is, that God will give your leadership faith, a vision to reach out and transform the community around you with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. A vision for growth so that you would expand out of this place and perhaps find a much bigger building as a store which you bring the harvest Amen. when God gives you the harvest. Amen. Because God expects us to go out to where they are. Yes. What one man has called the search theology, where we go to search for sinners rather than to expect the sinners to come to us. That is uh, Peter Wagner. Because many times we try to put up put up programs, advertise and say, come to our church. But that is like fishermen saying to the fish, with lots of advertisement, lights in the water and so on, saying, hey, come to the market. We meet you in the market. Come to the stores. Where we can sell you. How many fish do you think will be willing to do that kind of thing? In fact, you'll realize that even when you invite people into your church, they don't stay long if they are not converted. Amen. They will stay for one hour or two and they will feel very uncomfortable. They will leave. You need to go where they are and take the gospel to them where they are. Praise the name of the living God. And number three, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for empowering the recipients to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ implies that the task of fulfilling the Great Commission becomes that of the entire body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to the early church, but he wasn't limited. The outpouring wasn't limited to those first few. The Holy Spirit was supposed to keep coming upon the broader body of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the generations of the church for the same reason to equip or to empower the church to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is interesting how sometimes as a church we deviate from the purpose of God. You get the impression that the reason the Holy Spirit was sent is for us to speak in other tongues or to shout louder in the church. There's nothing wrong like, I mean, with shouting because in heaven when you read the book of Revelation, there is a lot of noise. So, if you are anti noise, you are going to be very much in trouble when you get to heaven. You might get a heart attack there. But all I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit given to the church was given for a purpose. And one of the main reasons the Holy Spirit was given was to empower the church for us to become witnesses. To be able, first and foremost, to transform the community around us, our Jerusalem, our Judea. And then, having 
we learn lessons on how to do it, we can be able to do it better abroad. And I find that, as a pastor, I found that people grow spiritually much more when they are involved in the Great Commission. They read their Bibles a lot more faithfully because they need to look for answers for the challenges that they meet when they go to talk to sinners. Because sometimes they go out and the pastor is not there. They find a sick person who needs prayer. Find people with needs. And they can't say to the pastor, there's somebody with a need here, come and pray. No. They have to pray. Amen. And sometimes, even if they don't know how to pray, they pray like the pastor. And God works. Amen. Praise the name of the living God. Amen. The Great Commission is our main responsibility. When I first became a pastor in 1986, I hadn't been trained. I'd been an elder for a number of years. Uh, the pastor left me with a church of uh, about 140 adult members in a very difficult situation because Ginger was very resistant to the gospel. When I came in 1982, the church I took on as a pastor later on was only about 40 to 60 members and it was the largest. There were only about 3, 4, 5 other congregations. Most of them much smaller than that. 30 members, 10 members. I think there was one with about, I mean with less than 10 members at that time. It was a very difficult area. There was a lot of sin in the area. A lot of resistance to the gospel. I remember that one girl's school was given a particular nickname meaning that there was a lot of immorality in that girl's school that men went to get girlfriends from that school at ease. I remember that in one street where I stayed called Lobas Road then there was a lot of immorality at one spot girls during school holidays used to come to stand there like these vehicles for special hire, taxis be rented by someone. And that is how bad it was. There were notorious nightclubs there where people used to kill each other. And for some reason, God allowed me to stay in that street. And my spirit was so stirred up. I said, Lord, either I leave this street or sin leaves this street. So we began to fast and pray lots of times. And um, I remember when I became a pastor, I was desperate to see God work because, as I said, I hadn't been trained, so I didn't exactly know what am I supposed to do as a pastor. Uh, so I took time to fast and pray. I waited on God for 40 days. Some of those days just took one meal, others fruits, others just water. But I was asking God, what do I do with this church? And God spoke to me three things. One, train leaders. Two, train intercessors and actually get them praying. And three, train people in evangelism skills and take them out. I had already been training leaders, so I continued doing that. Remember, I hadn't gone to Bible college. But I had a heart to train leaders. I thought I couldn't do it alone. I thought that I needed to equip others to do work of ministry. And then I started training people in prayer, not by giving lectures about prayer, but by actually praying and mentoring some of them to lead prayer. And then, of course, I made sure that everybody in the church was taught how to witness on a one-on-one -on -one to everybody else. I did that training again and again. And um, we did a lot of praying to begin with. I do remember that um, every um, last Friday of the month or first Friday of the month, we had an all-night prayer meeting. And 90% of the focus of our prayers was for our community to be saved. We came up with the slogan, the vision, Ginger for Jesus. We even made a song out of it. And we would sing it on Sundays, sing it in crusades, sing it in open meetings, open air meetings. And um, we had a number of 40-day fasts as a congregation. Sometimes once a year, sometimes twice. But we were desperate to see the area change. 
I remember that in one of the um, 1988, I think it was, before we held the crusade, uh, that year we had had a number of prayer vigils because we were so desperate to see God. Um, one of the deacons was anemic because we were taking so much time in prayer. Those were difficult days in Uganda. Actually, it was two deacons who were anemic. Um, we didn't have very much to eat after your fasting and pray. I remember putting one of the deaconess, uh, a deaconess on a special day just to kind of help her out of the situation she was in. I was a preacher in the crusade, but I was sick during that time. And when I was taken to see a doctor, my sickness was anemia. I lacked blood. I was praying so much. I was working with my hands uh, to stay alive. But um, that was taking its toll on me. I am just telling you that there was a cost to it. But we did not give up. We uh, encouraged the people to do what we called Operation Jericho. An area where you live or work, you walk around that area claiming it for the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, during your lunch hour break, instead of eating, you could be walking and praying. And a number of people uh, got involved in that. Then we also had what we called Operation Andrew, where I encouraged everybody in the church to sign up to pray for at least seven sinners to get saved. Amen. Uh, sometimes on Sunday, we would each hold our card with seven sinners and claim them for the Lord Jesus Christ. I also encourage them to bring those people to church. One of the Sunday, one Sunday in a month, we turned it into an evangelism Sunday, where everyone was expected to come with a sinner in addition to their family, a friend, a relative, a neighbor, a workmate who didn't know Christ, come to church. The message would be evangelistic, would pray for the sick, would lay your hands on the people to receive the Holy Spirit, and so on and so on. A few Sundays, well, first of all, several times I took people out, knocking on doors. I remember when I had just come to Jinja, after I trained the first lot of people, I took a few people out with me for six weeks daily to the hospital quarters to do witnessing. We didn't win many people, but there was a change in the lives of the people. First of all, in terms of their perspective of Christianity, their vision, what they should be doing in the church. They began to look outward. Some Sundays when we arrive in the church, we would pray for about 20 minutes. And I would say, Jesus said, if your ox falls in a pit on a Sabbath, you'll go to pick it, won't you? Our people put people in twos and say there are many oxen in our neighborhood this Sunday who are in the pit of sin. And it does us no harm not worshiping the Lord this morning but going out because that's what he would do anyway if he was a pastor of this church instead of being here on Sunday morning some Sundays actually he might be in the neighborhood. I mean if you know Jesus very well he did that. He did what was prohibited on the Sabbath. To go out of the house and then go into neighborhood healing the sick and so on. He did that. And I said if it was the pastor of that church he would have done that. Let's go out. And we would go for about one or two hours sharing the gospel. Praying for the sick. And I would say to, to them come back to the church. If there are any people who are saved bring them here. Let's hear their testimonies. Let's pray for them. We also held crusades. I walked through that street sometimes like a madman in a prayer closing the nightclubs in the name of Jesus. Cleaning up the sites. That particular street became, one end of it became a place where we held crusades. There was an open ground which is now built up. But that time it was open. For many years we held crusades there. God walked in that street. And one of the notorious nightclubs used to be called Evening Glory. It closed up. Because we asked God to close it up. After two years, that congregation had grown from 140 adult members to over 400 adult members. The impact was much in the community. Now, of course, over the years, many other churches have been planted in Jinja. 
we have had lots of prayer efforts, including one day mobilizing, I mean, one season mobilizing over 40 congregations in our area, over 60 actually, in our area, to fast and pray together for 40 days in a tent which we had pitched up in Kakindu Stadium to claim that area for Jesus. And I could continue telling you stories. But one of the stories I could tell you was the problem which the Anglican diocese there had, which is the same as Episcopal. There were rival bishops and there was a lot of division and so on. Um, the standing bishop, who was actually an American, called us to pray. And since we went on to pray, lots of things have happened. They set in a born again bishop who was really transforming the area. I traveled with one young lady, I mean, not one young lady, one uh, with, with, with a housewife to a burial a few weeks ago, and she was saying, You need to come and see what is happening in the Church of Uganda. You need to see the revival. You need to come, see the, come to the cathedral because. The Saved People's Fellowship has grown and grown. They have their own fellowship. It's not like an Anglican church anymore. But all I'm saying is this, that the work we're doing within our own congregation affected the other congregations and affected the other denominations. God somehow uses you as a change agent. Somebody to create impact. Somebody to set up other fires. When you are willing... To do it God's way. The choice is always to remain in the comfort zone, doing things the way you have done them for so many years, or seeking God to change and to embrace something new in God, to embrace growth, to embrace those new challenges that are brought by growth. Because I'm not sure that Peter and John knew that the church was going to explode that way. But when it exploded, there was grace in the Lord for them to cope up with the growth. To such an extent that even when there are problems in the church, they did not want to give their time to solving the problems. The growth was so precious for them to see it die. They said, you appoint men from among you to take care of this pastoral work, which we these days call serving tables. But... It was more than just putting food on the uh, table for widows. It was also to give them pastoral counseling and pastoral care. They needed that. And the apostles said, we will give ourselves the minister of prayer and the minister of the word. Let me conclude with this challenge from a communist. Now, communism is now dead and buried. But uh, the words of a former communist who did not see as much commitment in the Christians to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ as they communists were uh, committed to their own cause, the cause of communism, wrote this. We communists have a philosophy of life which no amount of money could buy. We have a cause to fight for, a definite purpose in life. We subordinate our petty personal selves into a great movement of humanity and if our personal lives seem hard and our egos appear to suffer through subordination to the party then we are adequately compensated by the thought that each of us in his small way is contributing something new and true and better for mankind there is one thing which I am in dead earnest and this is the communist cause it's my life, my business, my religion, my hobby, my sweetheart, my wife, my mistress, my bread, and my meat. I work at it in the daytime. I dream about it in the night. I cannot carry out a friendship, a love affair, or even a conversation without relating to this force which both drives and guides my life. I evaluate people, books, ideas, and actions by how they affect the communist cause and by their attitudes toward it, towards it. I have already been in jail because of my ideas, and if necessary, I am ready to go before a firing squad. Wow. 
What a challenge to us Christians. Would we be willing to lay our lives down for such a noble and greater cause than communism which Jesus Christ has championed? How often days and moments pass by while we Christians fold our arms and remain neutral to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. How often years and moments pass by while we continue with business as usual in our churches, doing programs which are not producing results, which are not touching the world, which are not transforming the community, which are not furthering the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us that we may heed to his call for us to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations beginning with our Jerusalem, Brandenton, the area around where we live, where we work, where our sanctuary is located, that God would give us a holy anger against the devil that would want to rip him of all the souls that he has locked up in this place over the years and bring them to the house of God to serve God in liberty and in freedom to the glory and honor of the living God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I want to appreciate you for my brother Chuck and the entire leadership of this church. A church can only go as far as the leadership is able to take it through the vision of that God gives or through the vision that they themselves come up with. Your vision for the church is that I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Which means that as much as we are supposed to be a family under God, we are also an army, an occupation force. We are supposed to be advancing the kingdom of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ has to be preached. And we are to gain ground as we take spoil, as we set people free, and as we occupy until you come. I pray that, Father, you will stir up the heart of my brother, Chaco God, to take his community for the Lord Jesus Christ. To reach this community like no other church exists here. Sometimes we don't do as much as we should do because we think everybody else is doing it. Because we see other churches around us. Lord, would we do it like it's only us doing it? Help us, our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.